Hi, good morning or evening or afternoon, whenever you're watching this. This is the week four recap video. Today, we're just gonna go over the week, right? Um, so let's go over it. Everything, uh, in this week we finished off unit three and transitioned over to unit four. Uh, and let's take a look at the agenda. So on Monday, we went through lesson three. Most of that assignment, it was for you to finish on your own. We did through, we did do most, uh, some of it uh, in class, but most of that is for you to finish. Uh, on Tuesday, I explained the unit assessment one last time and then gave you guys in class time to complete the multiple choice test. Um, you can still do it all on your own, but in class time was given. On Wednesday, <clears throat> on Wednesday, we made sure everyone has the new uh, unit four notebook and then we gave you time for the unit four pretest. Same thing, multiple choice test, but in class time to do it. Thursday, we worked on notes on the properties of compounds. On Friday, we finished off those notes and moved on to lesson one. This week, there are quite a few things due, five things. First of all, lesson three, we started that last week. We finished it this week. It's due this Friday. Uh, the multiple choice test due this Friday. The Mendeleev's table where you are identifying nine unknowns as well as your research on an element of your choice due this Friday. And your unit notes due this Friday. If you didn't complete any of this stuff and it's not in by Friday, I mean, first of all, you had a lot of notice. Second of all, though, if you didn't, you could still turn it in later. The only thing is you're gonna have a capped score out of uh, four out of five. So even if you did five out of five style work, sorry, it's late, four out of five is the deal. Uh, and country lucky stars, it's not uh, two out of five. Anyway, also do is the weekly reflection. That's a consistent thing that should make a habit of doing. Uh, and kind of let's get started here. Let's see, we're looking at unit three here. Uh, to get to the unit three folder, we wanna go on Schoology. The first link there, unit three. After that is the unit three presentations and the unit three assessment rubric. So let's go ahead and click this and kind of zoom in here. Go at 150%. And let's go here. Actually, while I'm looking at this table of contents, the three sets of notes that I'll be checking for on Friday are going to be the complete notes on subatomic particles, the energy of atoms, and the nomenclature and 3D structure. We did all of these notes in class, so there's no real reason for you guys to have these blank. Even if it is blank, you have access to the document I work out of. Um, so there should be no issue there. Now, let's start with lesson three. For lesson three, we are talking about the bonds between atoms. And how do we decide what kind of bond is formed between the atoms? And the primary way you wanna figure this out is through electronegativities and through the difference. And so say for example, you have oxygen or fluorine. Fluorine's a great example. Fluorine has an electronegativity of four. Sodium has an electronegativity of 0.9. And so if these two had a bond, the type of bond it would be is determined by the difference in those electronegativity values. And so four minus 0.9, that's about 3.1. And so that's firmly an ionic bond. And so for number two, I want you to list the difference, uh, like list the electronegative difference range for those three types of bonds. It's literally listing out the ranges you see here. So zero to 0 0.3, 0 0.3 to 1.7, 1.7 to 3.3. I want you guys to do this, not because I'm uh, being lazy and I don't want to type things in. No, I, I think there's value in being able to type something and get that knowledge just kind of memorized in there. So what we did next, I went through two of these examples. And so what you're supposed to do is find the electronegative values for carbon and hydrogen, carbon and sulfur, oxygen and hydrogen, sodium and chlorine, uh, cesium and fluorine. Um, there are two sites to do this. You can find them on, you can find the values on ptable.com or you can go into the notes on the 
Uh, or you go on to the bottom of lesson two. I scroll up here. The last chart here has the electronegative values for all those different elements. And so if I look at carbon, these are the values from p-table. If I look at carbon, we have 2.55 minus 2.2. That's the value for hydrogen. So that difference is 0.35. Looking at the chart here, 0.35 is just barely a polar covalent bond. So we put that in. And the more electronegative atom is carbon. And we write the compound as CH. We're not doing the full compound. We're just listing what the bond would be typed as. So we have carbon and sulfur, same deal. 2.58 minus 2.55. Sulfur is more electronegative. And so this is a very much this is very much a nonpolar covalent bond. And so the more electronegative atom by it is sulfur, but if you looked at the bottom of the if you looked at the other chart, you'd find that sulfur and carbon are basically identical. One second here. Let me go ahead and change my microphone. This the way. Oh, that's about, I think I lost battery on that. So if you look at carbon, carbon's at 2.5, sulfur also at 2.5. And that's why for this bar here, the more electronegative atom is up to debate. I personally think it's sulfur, but whichever end, uh, whichever table you end up using, it's dependent on that. And so your compound is either CS or SC. You have to do the same process for these last three chemicals. All right. Now, for an ionic bond, Before the number four answer, we had to determine the cation and anion for NaCl. The cation is whichever one lost an electron. And because it loses an electron, it lost a negative charge. That means the remaining charge is positive. Um, think of it like clearing debt, right? If you're in debt, negative. If you're in debt and you lose the debt, you are now net positive. And that's probably the best metaphor to work with. I should have thought of that one sooner. Um, so if we look at sodium here, sodium loses the electron to chlorine, chlorine gained the debt, chlorine is now negative. And so chlorine is the anion. That's just a practice in some vocab there. Next up, we got uh, the difference here between covalent and ionic bonds as far as them forming molecules. So covalent bonds are very strong. Are they stronger than ionic bonds? Eh, not really, but they are pretty strong. Uh, and so if you compare them to an ionic bond, NaCl, which is an ionic bond, takes forever to melt. But something like, I don't know, water, H2O, this covalent, doesn't really take that much time to evaporate even. And so the Forces in an ionic compound are a lot stronger than covalent. Covalent bonds are strong. They are. But they're not as strong as ionic bonds. So for these three, I have you guys ask, uh, answer them on your own. And we did a small little lab together. We looked at salt. We looked at sugar. We looked at some copper and some iron and some uh, calcium carbonate. Carbonate. Actually, let me just uh, go ahead and check. No, it was calcium chloride. That's what we looked at. That's calcium chloride. And so as we did this experiment, we saw that some of these things melted. Some of them dissolved in water. Some of them conducted electricity. And some of them conducted electricity while in water. Now, what we want to know is what type of bond they had. I have to lock up a little bit. And so you see that the sodium chloride didn't melt, but the sugar did. 
Sugar is just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygens. And those are all covalent bonds. So this molecule of sugar was a covalent bond. Sodium chloride, on the other hand, was ionic bond. And there are two ways we saw this. One, we looked at those molecules. We looked at the uh, geometry of these molecules. But two, you see that sodium chloride didn't melt. That's a really important sign. If it didn't melt, that tells us that those bonds are very strong. And that tells us, again, that this is an ionic bond. For our unknown, which is calcium chloride, it didn't melt. That tells us that it's an ionic bond. But copper and iron, those are metals. They have metallic bonds. Um, that should require too much explaining. So for most of this assignment, you do have to do it on your own. Um, and so that's the luck with that. It's due on Friday, this February 5th. That takes us to this table. Now, I explained this in class once, and I'll explain it again here. Uh, your table, right? this uh, Mendeleev's table, the goal here is not to put these data cards in the shape of a periodic table. It's helpful to do that. True. Go ahead and click this. It's helpful to do that, but the real goal of this is to use the information given to you to identify these nine elements. Now, you're allowed to use this Google slide, make a copy of it. It's a blank periodic table. And you could just put, you know, your known values here to give yourself some context, right? Because if you have nine unknowns, well, your nine unknowns are not going to be any of these, right? These are definitely not your uh, nine unknowns. And so fill it in, right? What do you have? Oh, I got copper. I got carbon. I got chlorine. I got argon. I got helium. I know it's not any of those. Check out my unknown number one, right? Use the information here and P table to kind of guide you, right? Help yourself figure out these unknowns. Uh, is it the density that's going to give it away? Is it the melting point? If you have them organized in certain patterns, we could actually just, we don't even need P table. We just compare and contrast. Uh, so, the biggest giveaway for this one, by the way, is the hardness. It's very brittle. And so it's solid. It's gray. That tells us it's kind of a metal, but just brittle metal. And so brittle metal, that probably means metalloid. That's your hint. Um, let's move on. So after you've identified your nine unknowns, the big thing here is how did you do it? Was it the melting point? Was it the density? Was it the combination of both? Was it the color? I mean, one of the metals, one of the uh, uh, one of the materials could be silver. It could be gold. Right? Was it the color that gives it away? How did you find out what you find out? And then afterwards, I had you guys pick an element of your choice. And you're going to research it and present that information. Either just you know as an essay down here, a Google slide show presentation that's linked down here. Somehow to present it, your choice. And that would be it for unit three. Make sure you complete that multiple choice test. If you need more uh, attempts, just let me know. I'll be glad to give them to you. Uh, but you shouldn't take more than three. All right, next up, we are talking about unit four. And so that brings us to the end of unit three. We're done here. Uh, you can always come back and finish up whatever you have missing, but we're mostly done here. We're moving on to unit four, bigger things and brighter things. The first thing that I had everyone do was, uh, let me see, is this one? I had everyone open up the chemistry notebook. Every period has a different notebook, but open that up, go into file, make a copy, and they should share that co uh, copy to my email. at lusd.net and lamia.le1 at lusd.net. If, for example, you are in period one. After making the copy, I had everyone take a pretest. Now that's not due until the 12th, but it isn't your best interest to finish this test. Uh, this way I could see how scores improve as time goes on. And so uh, if you don't, I can't see any improvement. So I'm just assuming you're a genius by the end of this, uh, rather than you know the flawed human beings that we all are, or most of us. I thought I'm perfect. 
So after doing that, we start on some notes. Um, let's go ahead and close the uh, ESD presentation. And for these set of notes, we're doing something different nowadays. I'm using something called Pear Deck. The Pear Deck is an interactive thing. It's kind of replaced the uh, Zoom uh, poll, Zoom questions that I like to ask. Uh, so we'll see how that works out. I've been liking it so far. Hope you guys have too. Anyway, we move it on. And for you know, four, the idea here is to transition away from individual atoms. We've been talking about those individual atoms. Uh, and we're going to be transitioning towards molecules, right? Just like how a cell builds up an organ and organs talk to other organs. Well, atoms build up molecules and molecules attract or repel other molecules. So let's go ahead and zoom in here. And so what we're going to start with are those forces that connect the molecules together. These are some of the properties of compounds. Um, and so let's get started with the presentation. So the properties of these compounds, the forces that we're going to talk about are called intermolecular forces. Inter meaning between, right? Between molecules. Uh, I'm going to call it IMFs because intermolecular forces is way too much of a mouthful. And so bonds like ionic bonds, covalent bonds, metallic bonds, those are in between atoms. IMFs are in between molecules. And so I ask you guys to pick which image here shows an intermolecular bond. And most of you guys did it correctly. And it is the hydrogen bonds, right? We have a molecule of H2O, a molecule of H2O. The bonds between them are those hydrogen bonds. And so these bonds, these bonds between molecules are dependent on polarity. Let me go ahead and show you what I'm talking about here. They're dependent on polarity. And the way polarity works is that you need a dipole to be made. A dipole is just something that has a positive end and a negative end. You're going to be seeing this symbol a lot here. These molecules aren't completely negative and completely positive. They are partially negative or partially positive. And so the symbol for that is like a weird looking S and like with a hook on it. And that S doesn't stand for hope. It stands for partial. And so if I look at water, the oxygen molecule on water is partially negative, while the hydrogens are partially positive. And if I split this in half, that tells me I got a dipole, two poles, a positive end and a negative end. And so this one is polar. Look at ammonia. It's got a partial, positive, partial negative up here and partial positive down there. It is also polar. But look at carbon tetrachloride. The individual chlorines are very negative. The individual carbon is very positive. But if I took this molecule, it is completely surrounded by negative uh, chlorines. And so if I split it in half, negative and negative, well, that's not a dipole. If I split it this way, negative, 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 I can't get a positive end no matter what I do. This molecule is therefore nonpolar. And last one here, carbon dioxide. Oxygens, as you know, are typically negative. Carbon, typically positive. And if I split this, let's say just straight down the middle, uh, I have negative on either side. This is nonpolar. And so when it comes to intermolecular forces, these two molecules are going to have a very easy time just bonding to whatever. These two, on the other hand, will not be doing that. And clear those drawings off. And so we have three different chemicals. In class, I asked you to drag those icons to, uh, let's say, yeah. I had you guys drag these uh, icons to uh, what you think were the polar molecules and nonpolar molecules. And we got that eventually. We got that this one is polar because of the electronegative differences. This one is nonpolar. It's all right here. Polar, nonpolar. Because these electronegativities are the exact same. 
fluorine and chlorine, though, it's kind of polar. This one is very negative. This one's very positive. But remember, there's, a, there's three more. And so no matter how we cut it, no matter how we cut it, it's always going to be negative. There's no positive side to this. That tells us this is nonpolar. So going back to it, in your notebook, we have this question here. Which molecules are polar, which are nonpolar? I ended up screenshotting the uh, slide as we took it. And so we have kind of a mess. But overall, we could see that, yeah, we got some people saying this is nonpolar. We have a lot of people saying this is nonpolar. A few people saying this is polar, and maybe a couple people just saying, uh, well, I don't know. Overall, though, it was a good, uh, good thing to see. Right. So polarity is how we determine our interaction forces. And the first one I want to talk about is a dipole-dipole force. Imagine a box of magnets, and you uh, shake the box around. You're going to have a bunch of magnets that get stuck to each other because their ends end up interacting. And this is what dipole-dipole interactions are. We have positive charges, negative charges that attract uh, to each other. And we have negative charges and positive charges that attract to each other. And then other molecules just come right in. And so with ionic bonds, like actually, yeah, in dipole-dipole bonds, you'll typically get something like a crystalline structure, right? Very nice, very ordered. This is a very strong IMF. It takes a lot to break these kinds of bonds. I can clear this. And so the second question I asked was, which would have a higher uh, melting point? We have BR, BR, and CLI. And so with BR, BR, bromine, let's just assume this guy is negative. Both of them are equally negative. If another bromine came in, Thanks up, bro. But another bromine came in. Because these are also negative, they're going to repel each other. They're not going to form very stable bonds. Chlorine and iodine, though. Chlorine is negative. Iodine is partially positive, partially negative. Another chlorine iodine will come in. And iodine will be attracted to the chlorine. The chlorine will be attracted to the iodine. And this becomes a very stable bond. And so as far as higher melting point is, this one's higher. It's higher because it's more stable. It takes a lot of energy to break that bond. Let's go ahead and clear this. Open the notebook and make sure we answer that question. So same scenario. One is a polar, one is a nonpolar. The boiling point, which is basically the same features as melting point is higher. It's higher than the bo other boiling point of BR2. And it's because of those dipole-dipole interactions, the interactions between a positive and a negative part of polar molecules. Now, the second IMF that we're going to talk about is a dipole-induced dipole, -induced dipole uh, IMF. And this one is a temporary dipole. It's kind of weak because it's temporary. If you ever see that phrase temporary, that definitely means it's weak. And so what that is, is if you have something like positive, like these hydrogens, well, the oxygens right here are kind of negative, and so they'll attack. And so you have a induced dipole. This becomes more and more negative. This oxygen is more and more negative. And the other oxygen becomes more positive. No, this doesn't very this doesn't last very long because what happens if this oxygen goes over here? Well, all of a sudden your bond breaks. Now you've got negatives, this is negative, they repel. It's not a very long-lasting kind of bond. And so the question that was being asked for that one is which is stronger or weaker? A dipole dipole or a dipole induced dipole? And so because it's temporary, the one we we're just talking about uh, is very weak. The dipole induced dipole is a very weak type of force. We have that there written in blue. 
zooming right along. This is just a recap video after all. We have hydrogen bonding. This one is the strongest type of intermolecular force because it's so clear cut. Hydrogens are very positive and they typically are attracted to most negative, uh, negatively charged atoms. And so in water, these hydrogens get attracted to the negative parts of these oxygens. And so that kind of explains the strength behind solid water. Why does solid water turn into ice? Well, it's got a lot of hydrogen bonds in it. And when it warms up, well, some of those bonds get broken and we have isolated uh, H2Os hanging around, but some of them stick around. And so we get the weird like fluid shape that we think of water. See those rounds off? Uh, and for this one, I basically had you guys draw the charges for those waters and then connect the, uh, connect the positive and negative charges. Nothing too fancy here. A last force is a London dispersion force. Uh, a couple of notes about these. London dispersion forces are also called dispersion forces. They're also called van der Waals forces. And this is a also very temporary uh, type of bond. It's also super broad. What I mean by that is literally every kind of atom could have a London dispersion force in it. All it needs are electrons and protons. And so what happens here is that sometimes, even though the electrons are moving around, they're spinning, they're doing their own thing, uh, sometimes they line up. And if they line up, we get a partially negative charge and a partially positive charge. And so this means that there is a dipole. The dipole attracts the electrons from a different molecule and now those electrons become organized and become negative partially. And the proton is all the way out there and it becomes positive and that attracts more. And so this force is kind of the reason why gases kind of stick together. Uh, it's the reason for small little uh, bits that kind of explain why things stick together when they, in your mind, shouldn't. And this is a very temporary type of bond. The reason being, and there's three major reasons, but look at the size, right? Protons are absolutely massive. They're like the size of the sun, while electrons are like the size of Pluto. There's a size difference here. Uh, more importantly, these things are spinning around all the time. These protons or these electrons like to move. They don't get stuck. They don't like being stuck. And lastly, electrons are negative. They're not going to stay near the same, they're not going to stay near other ne uh, negative electrons. And so there's a built in tension there for these electrons to immediately disperse. And so for number four here, why is the dipole temporary? The electrons are always moving. The bonds only last so long. They want to repel each other. This dipole has a lot of things going against it. All right. And now we are at lesson one. So we covered this on Friday. We get to lesson one. You want to go ahead and copy and paste that from the uh, doc here. Copy and paste this into your notebook here. We've done that. So what we're doing here is we're exploring those intermolecular forces we just talked about. Now, realistically, this is how it goes down. Intermolecular forces, I'll just write on the screen here. Intermolecular forces, IMFs, these things create the properties of the chemicals that you, uh, you know, interact with almost every day. Properties. But, you can kind of work your way backwards. If you've got some properties you're curious about or you know about, you could work backwards and say, oh, okay, it's got this kind of property. That means it's got this kind of IMF. And so what we're doing here is we're working backwards. We're going to use evaporation time and surface tension to track the IMFs of these different compounds here. So we've got water. We all know what water is. Acetone, nail polish remover isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol, and glycerol, also known as glycerin. You can get most of this stuff um, out of Walgreens. 
Glycerol is a little bit tricky to find. Um, I end up using a facial cleanser, hydrator, moisturizer. Glycerin is apparently great. I had no idea, of it, by the way. Glycerin is apparently great at hydrating your skin. Um, and if you apparently add nitrogen to it, it becomes nitroglycerin. I had no idea. Uh, it also burns quite well. And so as we started, we had some predictions and observations. I was just asking people to rank what you think would take the longest to like evaporate or uh, which ones are the most complex. I forgot what the question was. But we ended up ranking glycerin as number one. Go ahead and clear the drawings. Okay. And so for number one here, how do you think strong or weak IMFs affect surface tension and how long a drop takes to evaporate? That's for you to figure out. Like, how do you think? Right? What happens if you have strong IMFs? Would you suspect things take longer? Things are stronger? What do you think? Now, uh, for this chart here, we just want to rank the size of the compounds on a scale of one to four. One being the lowest, four being the highest. And this isn't anything special. You just add up the number of elements you see, right? And so glycerol slash glycerin, very high out of four. Acetone, kind of in the middle out of two. That's nothing too big. Polarity though, for polarity, what you want to do is you want to see these oxygens. And you want to make sure you label them as negative. Now, oxygens are typically negative while hydrogens are typically positive. And so for most of these molecules, we could kind of start to see a pattern, except for maybe this one. For most of them, if we cut them down the middle, if we cut them down strategically, we could see that, ah, yes, it's overall negative on one side, overall positive on the other. Uh, Urban alcohol is a little bit of a mess. So we'll talk about that one in class. But all we're saying is, can you see a positive end and a negative end? And for most of them, the answer is going to be yes. And lastly, we want to see how many OH groups are in these chemicals. Um, really, that's not too complex. We just list out the OHs that we see here. Done and done. That actually will bring us to where we pretty much ended on Friday. Next week, we'll finish off lesson one and get started on our way towards this thing called stoichiometry. Ooh, I hope you're excited for that. All right, so as has been Mr. Azad with your weekly recap video. I hope you enjoyed. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Um,